Hello everyone, Mr. Walker here. This lesson is going to be on the heart, blood vessels, and blood pressure. So this first slide that I have here, we're taking a look at the surface of the heart on the left-hand side picture, and a section through the heart, taking a look at the interior on the right-hand side. I'll point out for starters that whenever you do take a look at a picture of a heart, it's as if you're taking a look at the heart on someone else. So in fact, what is the left-hand side of the picture is the right side of the heart over here, and this is the left side of the heart then on this side. You can think of the heart as being divided into four different quadrants, so that's what I'll do. I'll just draw a line somewhat horizontally across here and somewhat vertical, vertically this way. So these four different quadrants, what they are, are the four different chambers of the heart. And if I do the same sort of thing on the right-hand diagram, this is dividing it horizontally. This is the one here that is dividing it vertically. And we can see a little bit more clearly on the right-hand picture how we do have these four different chambers. So these first two chambers here, I'll put an A, the, that stands for the atria. Plural is for atria, singular is atrium. So these two are the receiving chambers. They're going to be receiving blood that's coming into the heart. And the two lower chambers, they are called the ventricles. So I'll put a V for the ventricles. And they are the pumping chambers that are going to push the blood out of the heart. So if we do go back to the left-hand picture here and sort of point out where these are on the surface, the two upper chambers, the receiving chambers, they're actually fairly small. So this one here, and now I'm going to specify not just that it is the atrium, but this is now the RA for the right atrium. And this one here that we just see a portion of, that would be the left atrium. Similarly, this is kind of the dividing line. If we take a look at the surface, these blood vessels and the fatty tissue here, dividing line between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. So blood has to then get into the heart. So let's take a look at that first of all. Uh, blood vessels are attached to each one of these four different chambers. The blood vessels that bring the blood into the heart, they are called the veins. Definition of a vein is a blood vessel that carries blood toward the heart. So going into the right side of the heart, into the receiving chamber on the right side, what we have is a blood vessel here, which is really bringing in the blood from the top portion of your body, your head and your upper limbs. And this one here, this one here does go in around behind and it brings the blood into that right receiving chamber as well. And this is now from the bottom part of your body, the abdominal area, the pelvic region and your lower limbs. On the other side of the heart, it's also receiving blood into the left atrium. And here the blood is coming in through this vein here, this one, and also these ones, these blood vessels again, tucking in behind and dumping the blood into the left side of the heart. So in all of these cases, those blood vessels that are attached to the atria, again, they are going to be the veins. And veins, once again, they always carry blood toward the heart. Now, now, if you do take a look at the different colors of the blood vessels that we see here, these colors are just representations. And what they are representing is the blue is representing blood vessels where you will find blood that's low in oxygen. That's what we call deoxygenated blood. And the red blood vessels high in oxygen or oxygenated blood. So that means that the blood that's coming in through this blood vessel here and this blood vessel here, these veins that are bringing blood into the right side of the heart, they are low in oxygen. Whereas the blood vessels that are the bringing the blood into the other side of the heart, these ones here and over here, they are going to be high in O2. So the reason why the ones on the right side of the heart are low in oxygen is they have come from all of your body cells, tissues, and organs that are using oxygen for the process of carbon dioxide. So by the time that blood gets back to the heart, it is low in oxygen. And what that means is it needs to pick up oxygen. So it needs to go from the lung, or sorry, go to the lungs. So if we follow that blood, trace the blood that's coming in through these blood vessels here, these veins, and these veins, by the way, they do have a name. They are the largest veins 
veins in your body. Collectively, they are referred to as the vena cava. The one coming in from the top is the superior, superior means above, and the one at the bottom, the inferior vena cava. So that blood comes into the right side of the heart. It is deoxygenated blood. It needs to go to the lungs. So in order to get it to the lungs, it needs to go from the atria down into the ventricle. So if we take a look at the right-hand picture, blood coming in, it's into the right atrium now, and now it's going to travel down into the right ventricle. From here, it can be pumped out to the lungs. So as soon as we talk about blood that's going away from the heart, now it's not a vein, now it's going to be an artery. So this fairly large blood vessel that we see here, in this case going in one direction and tucking in behind and going in this direction here as well. Again, it's a representation with the blue coloration indicating that that's deoxygenated blood. In both cases, it's going to the lungs. So on one case, it's going to be the left lung. And over here, it's going to be the right lung. Again, it's deoxygenated blood. It's going there to pick up oxygen and give up the carbon dioxide that it's picked up from your cells and from your tissues. So now this blood that has picked up oxygen from your lungs, it needs to be pumped to all of the cells and tissues in your body so they can use it for sight or respiration. So that blood that is coming from the lungs and back toward the heart, it's going to again come in these blood vessels here, red in color because now it's oxygenated. So that blood will travel in through the left atrium into the left ventricle and now it's got to get out. Where it's going to get out is through a blood vessel that tucks in behind here, this one, and this large blood vessel, the largest artery in your body. It is called the aorta. So whereas veins carry blood toward the heart, arteries carry blood away from the heart. So arteries that we have in this picture here, this one is an artery that's carrying oxygenated blood from the left side of your heart. This one here is an artery that's carrying deoxygenated blood from the right side of your heart. So in addition to the different blood vessels, one attached to each one of the chambers, you also need to be aware of valves that we do find in the heart. There are valves that we find in between the atria and the ventricles and valves that we find at the exit route out of the ventricles. So there is a valve located right here between the right atrium and the right ventricle. And this valve is an atrioventricular valve, atrioventricular indicating that, well, it is between the atrium and the ventricle. We also need to specify where it is. It's on the right side. So this one is the right atrioventricular valve. Over here between the left atrium and the left ventricle is the left atrioventricular valves. Valves are one-way doors. They only allow blood to travel in one direction. So in the case of these atrioventricular valves, when they are closed, blood does not go through. When they open up, the blood can only travel in this direction. It can only travel from the receiving chambers of the heart, the atria, and down into the ventricles. Once that blood is into the ventricles, now it needs to be pumped out of the ventricles. So the blood needs to travel from either side of the heart through more valves. So on the right side of the heart, we have this valve right here. Again, that's only going to allow blood to travel in one direction, and that's going out of the heart and into the bl this blood vessel right here, this artery. Again, that's going toward the lungs. On the other side of the heart, on the left side, we can just barely see it here, but there's a valve right here. And that's what's going to allow the blood to go out from the left side of the heart, tucking in behind here and going into this blood vessel. Again, these ones here, carrying blood away from the heart. They are the arteries. The one that's shown in red, I mentioned before, that one is called the aorta. Blood vessels, these large blood vessels that have to do with the lungs, they are called pulmonary. So the one that's carrying the blood away from the heart and toward the lungs, this one here is the pulmonary artery. These blood vessels here that bring the, the blood back to the heart from the lungs, those are the pulmonary veins. So in terms of the heart structures, 
it is really uh, 12, 13, maybe 14 different structures that you should be aware of. You should know where they are, you should know their function, and you should know the name of them. So what those are for starters are the one, two, three, four different chambers that we see here, the four blood vessels, the vena cava, I'll put that as number five, the vena cava, the other vein or veins, which are the pulmonary veins, number six here. Number seven, I'll put as the pulmonary artery, carrying blood away from the heart. Number eight, the aorta. So now we have the four chambers, we have the four blood vessels, one attached to each one of the chambers, the four valves, so we'll call that nine, 10, 11, and 12. A couple of other things that you should know, this dividing line between the two ventricles, it is called the septum. You should know that one as well. That is number 13. And one more, what holds these valves in place and only allows them to open in one direction? Those are these string-like fibers that we see right here that are attached to the atrioventricular valves, and those are called the chordae tendinae, and you can think of that as kind of the 14th structure that you do need to know with the heart. If we do take a look at the surface, there are some blood vessels that are running along the surface of the heart that we see here. Some of them in red, some of them in blue. These are the coronary blood vessels. They're the ones that deliver oxygen to the heart itself. So coronary arteries in red and the coronary veins in blue. <clears throat> This next slide here shows in general terms where this blood is going when it is pumped from the heart. So you can kind of think of the heart as a double pump. We have one side of the heart, the left side of the heart that's pumping to one portion of your body, the right side that's pumping to a different portion. Remember, you're looking at this on someone else. So this would be the right side of the body, the right side of the heart, and over here would be the left side. So everything on the right side of the heart, notice that it's blue in color. And again, what that means, if it's blue, it means that it is the deoxygenated blood. Deoxygenated blood. And everything that we see on the right hand side in red, the red indicating that it is oxygenated blood. So it's, if it's deoxygenated blood, what that means is that it has come from the body uh, where the cells are undergoing cellular respiration. And remember, with cellular respiration, the cells are using oxygen, they're producing carbon dioxide. Now you need to get that blood back to the lungs in order to get rid of that carbon dioxide and pick up more oxygen. So all of the blood that we're seeing in blue here, it doesn't matter if it's coming from the lower part of your body. It doesn't matter if it's coming from the abdominal area. If it's coming from your head, all of this blood is going into the right side of the heart. First of all, into the right atrium, then down into the right ventricle. And from there, it's picked up to the lungs. What is it doing in the lungs? Giving up carbon dioxide and picking up oxygen. So now we have blood that is oxygenated, but in order to circulate it around, it needs to go back to the heart. So that's why the heart is a double pump. The right side is receiving deoxygenated blood and pumping it only to the lungs. The left side of the heart is receiving oxygenated blood from the lungs and it's pumping it to everywhere else in the body where that blood can be used for cellular respiration. So if we do consider where that blood has to go when it's coming from the right side of the heart. It only has to go to the lungs, which are very, very close to the heart itself. So that means that the right side of the heart doesn't need to be quite as strong. It doesn't need to develop quite as much pressure or velocity in the blood compared to the left side of the heart, which needs to circulate that blood all through the rest of the body, including up to your head going against gravity. So because more pressure, more velocity is required, 
the left side of the heart, in fact, is stronger than the right side of the heart. So if we go back to this previous picture here, we can, in fact, see, even with this diagram of the heart, if we compare the thickness of the walls on the right versus the left ventricle, this again is the right side here, notice that it is considerably thinner than on the left side. This is muscle tissue. The bigger the muscle is, the stronger it is. So that means that the left side of the heart is bigger and stronger in terms of its ability to force the blood out of the heart. In terms of the amount of blood that's passing through each one of the sides going into the right side or going into the left side, it is the same. Both the right and the left side of the heart pump the same amount of blood at the same time. Each chamber can hold the same volume of blood, but it is the left side that can force that blood out with greater force, greater pressure, and with a higher velocity. We can take a look at an actual dissected heart here, or at least cutting through and looking into the ventricles, and we can see the same thing here. So the cavity that we see, this is the cavity on the left side of the heart, the left ventricle, even though it looks a little bit smaller here, the amount of blood that can be contained within the right ventricle, it is the same as well. But what is most definitely different is the thickness in the wall between the right and the left ventricle. So if we take a look at the thickness here, that's what we see on the right side compared to the thickness that we see here on the left side, much thicker, much stronger muscle with the left ventricle compared to the right ventricle. What about the atria? Well, they can pump as well. They are also muscular, but it's not that terribly significant in terms of moving the blood down into the ventricles. So this is a muscular wall here. This is a muscular wall here as well, but we can see even in this picture, they are fairly thin compared to the walls of the ventricles. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, blood that is circulating through the heart and the pattern which it follows. It's the same on the right side as the left side in terms of what is going on. Only on one side, of course, it's going to be the deoxygenated blood that's coming in and being pumped out. That is the right side of the heart and oxygenated blood on the left side. So if we take a look at these series of pictures that we see here, we can see the chambers, we can see the coloration with the blue and the red blood, and we can see the arrows, and that's indicating that the blood is going through the atrioventricular valve at the same time. So the two atria will contract at the same time. The ventricles are relaxed at the same time. So ventricular diastole. Diastole is referring to the fact that they are relaxed at this point. So the ventricles are relaxed. Only when they are relaxed can they fill with blood. For the most part, blood that is coming in through the veins, whether it's the vena cava here, or whether it is the pulmonary veins, as that blood does flow into to the atria, it's going to open up the valves and immediately flow right into the ventricles as well. And this is referred to as the passive filling. The atria do have some ability to contract, so that's what it's showing in the next picture here. They're contracting, and that's just going to force any additional blood down into the ventricles. So now what we have is the ventricles that are now full, and now what they need to do is they need to squeeze that blood out. So when the ventricles contract, that is ventricular systole, and this term systole is when we now have contraction of the muscles, and in this case, it's the ventricles that we're talking about. So take a look at the valves as well. When we do have the ventricles that are filling, which valves are open and which valves are closed? If the ventricles are filling, what that means is that the atrioventricular valves, those ones do have to be open to allow the blood to go from the atria into the ventricles. But take a look at the other valves, this one right here and the other one that's kind of hard to see. These are the other valves, the exits out of the ventricles. I'm not sure if I mentioned the name of them before, but they are called the semilunar valves, the right and left semilunar valves. And these ones are going to be closed when the ventricles are filling with blood. So we can see the same thing in the next picture here. So we once again see that this one here 
and this one here. Those are the semilunar valves. They are closed. The two atrioventricular valves, this one and this one here, they are going to be open. So again, that is the case when we do have diastole, when we have the filling of the ventricles. But once that blood is in the ventricles, now they are going to contract. As soon as those ventricles start to contract, blood is going to be forced up in the direction of the atria, but those valves are now going to slam shut. So now we see the atrioventricular valves that were open, they are now closed. If you listen to the heart with a stethoscope, what we talk about hearing are two different heart sounds. They are described as the lub and dub sounds, lub being the first heart sound, dub being the second heart sound. So when we hear the first heart sound, whether it's lub with one B or two Bs, that is the first heart sound, and what is going on is that is when the atrioventricular valves close. That is what you actually hear are these valves that are closing. So those valves have closed, the pressure is developing in the ventricles, something has to give, and once there is enough pressure that has developed, these valves, they're still closed here, but now as we go to the final image, we see that now those valves have opened. So semilunar valves are now open, blood can be forced out of the right ventricle, out through the pulmonary arteries and going toward the right and the left lungs to pick up some oxygen. On the left side of the heart, the oxygenated blood that came from the lungs, it's going to be pumped through this left semilunar valve out through the aorta and from there to all of the cells, tissues and organs in your body. So this is a cycle, which means eventually we need to get back to the beginning. So from this final picture, we will return to this one here. And what that means are those semilunar valves that were open, they're now going to become closed. So that's when we hear the second heart sound, which is referred to as the dub heart sound. So the lub sound is the closing of the two atrioventricular valves at the same time. The dub sound is the closing of the two semilunar valves at the same time. And this process is just going to continue on and on and on. And this is about, on average, about 70 times per minute in the average person. So a little bit more about the blood vessels. Again, you do need to know the definition of an artery and a vein. You do need to know the structure and the properties of arteries and veins as well, along with three other blood vessels. Those are the arterioles, the venules, and the capillaries or capillaries. Remember that arteries always carry blood away from the heart. Veins always carry blood back to the heart. So if I put the word heart up here, it shows that the artery is taking the blood away and veins are bringing the blood in. That is always the definition that holds when we're talking about arteries and veins. We can't just go by oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. Most arteries are oxygenated, but some of them are deoxygenated, and those are the pulmonary arteries, and the same applies to the veins as well. So if we do take a look at this picture here that shows the structure, there are some similarities and there are some differences between arteries and veins. First of all, both of them are big. They are macroscopic blood vessels. You typically don't need a microscope to see these ones, and especially the ones that are directly attached to the heart as a general rule. The arteries and veins attached to the heart, they will be the largest ones in the body. So the largest artery in your body is in fact the aorta, that one that is the exit going out from the left ventricle. So if we take a look at the structure here, what we see is that arteries are made up of multiple layers. They have multiple layers, which means that they're thick. In fact, these are the thickest in terms of the walls of all of the different blood vessels. If we take a look at veins, well, they're made up of multiple layers as well, but they're not quite as thick. So in the case of the artery, you can see that we have an outer layer, a muscular layer in both cases. So that's kind of important because what that allows blood vessels to do is change their diameter. So if you have the contraction of these muscles, that causes constriction of 
the blood vessels. If you have the relaxation of these muscles, then it causes dilation or the opening up of the blood vessels. We can see that the arteries have an elastic layer that's going to be kind of important for them to be able to stretch out when the heart does contract and we'll see that when i talk about blood pressure and we also see that the veins they do have something different and unique as well that other blood vessels don't have and that is a valve. So if it is an artery, look for the walls being thick, look for them being made up of multiple layers, look for them having this elastic layer. When we're talking about veins, look for them being a large diameter as well. In fact, the veins do have the largest internal diameter. The largest blood vessel internal diameter in your body is the vena cava. It has the largest internal diameter. So these veins throughout your body, they will have valves and we'll see sort of the significance of those. We already saw in the case of the heart that they do allow blood to go in one direction, but not to travel back in the opposite direction. For both of these, because there are multiple layers that make up the walls, what that does mean is that things cannot cross the walls. So in terms of exchanging things like oxygen and carbon dioxide and nutrients, that simply cannot happen across the walls of arteries or veins. So both of these are responsible for moving large amounts of blood from one part of the body to the other, but they're not actually responsible for the exchange of the oxygen, the carbon dioxide, and the nutrients. This picture here is showing us the three other kinds of blood vessels that you do need to know about. They are referred to as the arterioles, the venules, and in the middle here, up here and down below, these are the capillaries. So where do the arteries, where do the veins fit in here? Well, this picture, what it is showing is a capillary bed, which would be delivering oxygen to the cells in your body. So we'll just say that this is going to be a capillary bed that's going through your muscles. So blood is coming from the left side of your heart. That's where the oxygenated blood is. So from your heart, it is arteries initially that are going to take the blood away from the heart, branching into smaller and smaller and smaller arteries, eventually branching into, well, you can think of these art arterioles as just being the smallest version of arteries. And what they're also going to do is link together arteries to capillaries. At the other side, after the oxygen has been delivered to the muscle cells, now we have deoxygenated blood. So this blood then goes from the capillaries into the venules. You can think of these as a smaller version of the veins. So eventually a bunch of these will merge together into veins. And from here, it will go back to the heart. And in this case, it's going to be deoxygenated blood. So it's going to the right side of the heart. So whereas on the left side here, it's oxygenated blood that's coming from the left side of the heart. In blue over here, it's deoxygenated blood going to the right side of the heart. But really all of the action is taking place in the middle in the capillary bed. So it's here that we do have the exchange of oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nutrients. Capillaries are the smallest blood vessels in your body. And we already saw that arteries and veins are made up of multiple layers. Capillaries are only made up of a single layer of cells. They are very, very thin, and that's what's going to allow oxygen to diffuse across the lining of these capillaries, nutrients like amino acids and glucose to diffuse across, carbon dioxide to diffuse in the opposite direction, and wastes to diffuse in the opposite direction as well. So all of this is exchange is taking place within the capillaries. One other thing that I'll point out with this slide here, the entrance into the capillary bed, what we do have 
are some sphincter muscles and hopefully you'll recall that these are these sort of drawstrings or donut shaped muscles. If the donut hole is open, something can go through it, in this case blood. If the donut hole is closed, then nothing is going to go through it. So if we're talking about your muscles and if you're not exercising, then probably a whole bunch of these are going to be closed because you don't need a lot of blood that's going through the muscles if you're not exercising. If all of a sudden you start to exercise, now you need a lot more oxygen going to those cells. So these pre-capillary sphincters, they're going to open up and they're going to allow the blood to flow into that area. So they're going to sort of regulate where the blood is going to in your body in terms of where it is needed. So if you're exercising, your muscles need it. If you've just eaten a big meal, then the capillaries that are going through your abdominal area, they are going to need that blood. This picture here shows us uh, properties not only of the arteries and veins, but the other blood vessels as well, the arterioles, the venules, and the capillaries. So what we're taking a look at here is a few things. First of all, the number. When we talk about the aorta, there is one and only one. When we talk about the vena cava, well, there's the superior and inferior. They merge together. So either one or two, depending upon how you look at it in terms of the vena cava. These are the two largest blood vessels in your body. The vena cava, largest internal diameter, but both of them are very large blood vessels. When we take a look at the arteries and the veins, well, there's more than one. There are maybe dozens of arteries and veins. And as we go into the arterioles and the venules, there are more and more of them. When we get to the point of the capillaries, now we're talking about, well, there are billions, billions of these. And that relates to this one here, the cross-sectional area. So cross-sectional area, think surface area. So if we take a look at the diameter of, say, the aorta, and let's just say that it is this diameter here, very large diameter, a lot of blood can go through it, but you have only one of them. If we take a look at capillaries, they're tiny, 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 but you have billions of them. So if you add up the cross-sectional area of all of the capillaries in your body, it's much, much greater than the cross-sectional area of the aorta the arteries or the arterioles. So surface area again, what does it accomplish overall? It makes the process more efficient. What is that process going to be? Well, if we go back to the previous slide, I'm more efficient at this, more efficient at taking up oxygen and nutrients by the body cells and tissues and the blood taking up carbon dioxide and waste that are produced by your body cells. We see one other feature on this slide here. So we see a little bit about the structure, but we can also get some information about the properties of blood vessels, and that is the velocity that the blood is flowing through. So it doesn't show us any numbers here, but what it does indicate is that the blood that's traveling out of the aorta, very, very high velocity. As the blood goes through the large arteries, also a fairly large velocity. But take a look at the huge drop as the blood is traveling through the arterioles. The velocity of blood going through the capillaries, it's barely trickling through. Blood cells are barely moving through the capillaries, and that's what's going to allow time for that oxygen and the nutrients to diffuse out of the blood and into the surrounding tissues and the carbon dioxide and wastes to go in the opposite direction. The velocity does pick up again as we go into the venules, the veins, and ultimately to the vena cava because we do need to get that blood once again back to the heart in order to eventually deliver it to the, to the lungs to once again pick up some more oxygen. So a little bit on blood pressure. So we did already see that the arteries are made up of multiple different layers, and that is where we do see the highest blood pressure is going to be inside of the arteries. So this uh, picture that it does show, what it's indicating is that pressure is actually what is pushing out on the walls of the arteries. And what that is going to lead to, of course, is the blood that's flowing through from one region of the artery to the other. The smaller picture on the right-hand side, what it's showing is that we actually have a dual circulation. So the circulation in your body that is delivering blood to the lungs and taking it from the lungs, it is referred to as the pulmonary 
circulation. So I already mentioned the word pulmonary before. I said that it was the pulmonary arteries that are taking the blood to the lungs. That would be this one right here. It's pulmonary veins that are bringing blood back to the heart. That would be this one right here. So this circulation pattern, blood that is coming from the right ventricle, going out through the pulmonary artery to the lungs, coming back through the pulmonary vein and to the left atrium, that is a pulmonary circulation. All of the rest of it is referred to as the systemic circulation. So this is now the right side of the heart, that's, or sorry, the left side of the heart that is pumping the blood out through the aorta, delivering it to the upper part of your body, the lower part of your body, and eventually bringing it back through the vena cava to the right side of your heart. All of that is referred to as the systemic circulation. So because the lungs are fairly close to the heart and other things like your legs and your head are much, much further away, what that means is that for the systemic circulation, what you need is a much greater pressure and a much higher velocity of the blood. So once again, if we do go back to the thickness of the ventricles, remember that it is the left ventricle. The walls of the left ventricle are much thicker than the walls of the right ventricle. So why is this the case? Well, because they need to deliver blood through the entire body, everywhere except for the lungs, through the systemic circulation. So blood being pumped by the left side, yes, higher pressure, higher force, and a higher velocity. So this final picture that I'll show you here, it does show blood pressure. Blood pressure is measured in millimeters of mercury that is shown over here on the y-axis. And what we're taking a look at on the x-axis is a number of different blood vessels. So starting coming out of, and this picture is only dealing with the systemic circulation. So we would see a similar pattern for the pulmonary, only it would be the pulmonary artery instead of the aorta. It would be the pulmonary vein instead of the vena cava. And these numbers would be much, much lower because there's not as high a pressure. So starting with the aorta, the blood is pumped out with a great deal of force. And when it is pumped out, when the muscles of the of the heart, the ventricles are contracting, this creates a great deal of pressure and right up here is what that pressure is. So somewhere around 120 millimeters of mercury is the pressure that is created when the left ventricle pumps the blood into the aorta. Why we see this wave-like pattern is that the ventricles contract systole, that is the systolic pressure. That is the pressure at the top of these waves when the ventricles are contracting. But of course, the ventricles relax. When the ventricles relax, there's not as much pressure that's forcing uh, the blood through the blood vessels, through the arteries. There's not as much pressure pushing out on the artery walls. So what we see is that the pressure goes down. So when it does go down, that is when the heart is relaxed that is diastole, um, diastole in terms of the ventricles. So this is now referred to as the diastolic blood pressure. So that is the pressure coming out of the aorta. There is still pressure, and that's due to the elasticity of the blood vessels. So kind of think of this, when the ventricles contract during systole, the arteries are going to stretch out, but then as they relax, as the ventricles relax, we're going to have the recoiling of the arteries. That's going to maintain pressure within the aorta and the arteries, and that's going to allow the blood to continue traveling through the arteries. So yes, there is still pressure even during diastole, even when the ventricles are relaxed. So as that blood does go from the aorta and into the arteries, so going through the arteries in your arms and your legs, eventually it's going to reach smaller and smaller arteries. And we're still going to have 
blood pressure that's changing depending upon whether the heart is contracting or relaxed, we're still going to see this wave-like pattern. And when someone does have their blood pressure taken, usually it is their brachial artery in their arm. So it would be somewhere around here. So if we take a look at the upper number here, the systolic is about 120 millimeters of mercury. The diastolic is about 80 millimeters of mercury. And in fact, these would be typical or average numbers. So the way that this would be recorded is 120 over 80. This would be this individual's blood pressure. And again, the 120, the higher number is the one at the top. That is when the ventricles are contracting. The lower number, the 80 at the bottom, that is when the ventricles are relaxed. So from the arteries, again, eventually the blood goes into these smallest of the arteries or the arterioles. And notice that this is where we have a huge, huge drop in the blood pressure. When you do feel your pulse, whether it's your radial or your brachial pulse, what you're actually feeling is these arteries here. And when the heart contracts, they're going to go from a smaller diameter to a larger diameter, and you can actually feel that. You can feel the bulging out of the arteries when your heart does contract. But as the blood goes into your arterioles, you lose this pulsating action. When the ventricles are contracting and relaxed, there is no longer the differences in pressure. And again, we have this huge drop in the blood pressure. As the blood is going through the capillaries, it is very, very low. Again, the velocity is extremely low as well. And by the time the blood gets back to the heart on the right side through the vena cava, extremely low pressure. So how does it actually get back to the heart? if we have such low pressure. Well, remember some of the properties of veins, veins do have these valves. So if we talk about your lower limbs, and this is representing an artery that's maybe coming up from your legs. When your muscles in your legs are contracting, or when we do have these muscular layers, within the veins themselves, what those contractions of the muscles are going to do is they're going to push the blood up a little bit, but then valves are going to prevent that blood from going back down. Muscular contractions, whether it's skeletal muscles or in the veins themselves, will push the blood up a little bit further. And again, those valves will prevent the blood from going back down again. So these valves play a critical role in ensuring that the blood only travels in one direction, and in fact, ensuring that that deoxygenated blood throughout your body, because in the veins, it's extremely low pressure, and that's going to allow for this blood, even though it is under low pressure, to return to the heart.